thank you guys all for coming. Uh, the Gen Chi community is super excited about this because I feel like this is very much of a hot topic right now. How the heck are we going to get jobs? And especially a lot of these people are graduating college and really thinking about their first job. So I just want to dive in to this real quick, but let's start with quick intros. Feel free to just get started. Do a quick intro. I can start. I'm Avni. I'm the founder of Gen Chi, and I'm really excited to be moderating this event. And I'll pass it on to Leanna. Why don't you go ahead? Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Leanna. I am at Google, currently a program manager for people experience. But um, just before moving into this role, I was in recruiting for about five years with Google for engineers and product managers. I will popcorn it over to Marie. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Marie. Um, I am currently a recruiter at Netflix. Um, I am recruiting for their new game division. Um, so yes, Netflix has games. Um, and I have been a recruiter or in the recruiting space for the past 10 years. My background has uh, been both in entertainment and video games. Um, and I'm just so, so excited to be here. So I can't wait to take all your questions. Um, and I will pass it to Linda. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Linda. I'm a recruiter at Lockheed Martin. Um, I'm in aviation and defense, and um, I'm currently helping a lot of entry-level uh, roles, especially in our AMTAP department. So primarily focusing on our technician and defense um, industry and been there for over a year now. Um, so excited to be here and can't wait to share advice with you guys. Um, and I'll popcorn it over to Manny. Thanks, Linda. What's up, everyone? My name is Manny Duenas. I am a university recruiter here at Intuit. I specialize on the tech side, so software engineering, data science, AI, machine learning. I've uh, been here for almost two years, um, pivoting from nonprofit. Um, so my career is um, a little bit different. Um, wasn't always a recruiter. I've been in workforce development, um, coding boot camps, uh, in the career services space as well. So that's just a little bit about me, and I'll pass it back over to Avni. Awesome. Thanks for the intros, guys. Well, now that you guys have context, start dropping all your questions in the chat. And I will try my best to get to all the questions. But obviously, there's a lot of you here. Love it, Manny. You have a fan. Huh? Oh. <laughs> I'm a fan. <laughs> if you guys want to read the chat to me. <laughs> um, it's a bird. bird. Perfect. There, um, you have a bird on your shoulder. Sorry, I'm so distracted by that bird on your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Cool. Okay. Well, Manny, you have a you have the first question. What was the pivot from nonprofit to tech mentally in the whole process? Let me say mentally. Like yeah, question from Kelly. Kelly. Both mentally and the whole process in general. How was that pivot for you? Ooh, yeah. So uh prior to this, I was in the nonprofit space for almost four years. Um, I was working with young, young adults from underserved communities who were breaking into tech at Meta. Um, they were earning internships. And so um, I kind of rode the wave of Clubhouse into the seat that I'm in today. Um, you know, during the pandemic, I was very active on that platform. I made a lot of friends um, through that audio platform. And a lot of them happened to work in big tech, you know, connecting with managers, recruiters, allies, um, and everyone who was just trying to help job seekers out on their spare time. Um, I ended up connecting with a university recruiter. Her name was Gab Gabby Woody. Um, she was a manager at Intuit. See where I'm going with this, right? So through being active on this platform, you know, very active. You know, I was on their hosting events, you know, at least twice a week. Uh, and I collaborated with Gabby um, to do to host a university recruiting event. Um, and, you know, when the time was right, you know, I felt I had kind of plateaued in my current in that job. I reached out to a number of people, um, one of them being Gabby. Um, and I said, Hey, you know, um, you know, checking in, how are you doing? You know, what's, what's new with you? I'm, I'm also on the job market, you know, looking for X, Y, Z, you know, if you've got anything open, I would love to chat with you more. And it was really good timing because she was like, yeah, we're actually opening up some university recruiting roles. Um, so she actually like, I verbatim, could you not said, you know, you have really good timing. <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. Let me throw my hat in the ring. And I went through that process. Um, it was a few interviews, I would say maybe like three max, but the biggest piece and a lot of the people who are on this panel actually helped me during this process 
um, Liana and, and Marie, um, the final round interview was like a panel and I had to do a presentation, come up with like a recruiting strategy on how to recruit X amount of people in software engineering, finance, marketing, and like what that would look like, um, you know, for identifying that talent. So I hit up my friends, you know, leaned on my, my village um, and they were there for me and really, really helped me get to where I am today. Um, so I don't think I would be here without the support of friends, family. So I think one, networking played a huge role um, and as Marie would say, the long game, played that game really well. And here I am today. So mentally, I, it was, it was, it was freaking stressful as hell, you know, to get, to, to get to this point. But I think without having all the support, it would have been even more stressful. So I, I'm very grateful for the support that I've had. So hopefully I'll land my plane there and hopefully that's a sufficient answer. Yes. No, I love that answer. And I okay this all the time. Networking with your friends is the most underrated career hack. Cool. This is a question from Gia for Marie. What advice would you have for entry-level professionals on creating their own brand on LinkedIn? And what was one piece of advice that stuck with you from when you started creating your brand to now? Oh, I love that. Thank you for the question. Yeah. My piece of advice for anyone who wants to get started um, is really just the first thing off, like think about what do you want to talk about? Like what brings you joy? What are you passionate about? Um, really just, you know, thinking about those pieces. Um, and then from there, it's just building off of that. Cause really like when I built my, my brand and like what I wanted to talk about, I was like, I don't want to talk about things that I don't know anything about. Right. Like I know a lot about recruiting. I know a lot about video games and I know a lot about entertainment. Like I will stick to those three. And that's all that I, you know, cycle through when I'm talking on the platform. Um, and I think um, the biggest piece of advice that I've gotten is to just have fun with it. Like it really is about, you know, building your authenticity. And I think authenticity comes out a lot when you're just having fun. Like when you're just being yourself and you're talking about things you like. I mean, I look back at some of my posts even recently and in the past month, I'm like, I don't think I even posted anything about recruiting, but I think I just posted more about video games because there's just so much going on right now in video games that I just love. Um, but that continues to still build my brand. And obviously like that puts me in a place where people see me as authentic and see me as kind of like this expert, I guess, like in that field, um, just because I just love to talk about that stuff. So so the advice, if you're going to start making content, bringing, you know, um, building your brand is what do you want to talk about and why? And also, is it fun for you? Right. Because building your brand, yes, might feel like a job, but most of the time it shouldn't feel like a job. Like it should just feel like you're just being you on the platform. Um, and then the advice, um, again, like just have fun with it because um, your authenticity comes out from that. Totally. I think having fun with it is actually so important because that's how you create the best content if you're generally enjoying the process. So that's so true. Cool. I think one question that I found was interesting in chat was, what are our thoughts on using AI to apply to jobs? Um, I think this can be a broader discussion we can all have. I'm sure we've all had experience with this. Very curious to see like what you guys have seen and how that actually affects your job as a recruiter. Anyone want to jump in? I, I can do it. Um, I've done a lot of like sponsorships with like platforms that utilize AI. And I have a lot of friends who like built a course surrounding AI. And I actually took it to give an honest review. And honestly, AI is really like the new landscape and it's really changing the game. Like I know like I just built my mental health brand and um, like I had to get help. Like, cause I'm like, I don't know how to describe myself. Like I can like write posts like on mental health and everything, but like my designer was like, how do we describe Linda? And I'm like, okay, I need like help. I'm like, I don't know how to describe myself. And then the same as it goes for resumes, like chat GTP is so amazing for like resumes. Like it can give you like formats. It can like give you feedback. It literally is like your co-pilot essentially. It can like give you bullet points. It can help you tailor the job description. It's like, it's such an amazing resource, especially if you can't like afford like a resume coach, like chat GTP is your best friend when it comes to like resumes, tailoring, job search, interview prep, like it's phenomenal. Totally. I mean, it can be so helpful in the job search. I feel like we shouldn't be afraid of it. We should tap into it. It's not replacing our jobs, I don't think. 
And we definitely need like recruiters to be able to navigate that process, but it, it can help both recruiters and candidates to make the whole process more efficient. So I totally agree with that. Um, can we um, walk a little bit through the recruiting process? How do recruiters actually re screen through applicants? And like, what does that experience look like from recruiters point of view, especially on LinkedIn and using like LinkedIn tools for anyone to tackle? I can go ahead I and jump in oh, here. Go ahead. Um, so obviously Google is a really large organization. So there's a lot of different paths that your resume can get through um, the door, right? First is going to be through the careers portal with an applicant uh, application system that is, you know, um, relying on an algorithm. So your resume does have to kind of pass the kind of like the keywords and such, right? But we have a, a screening team that will go through and at the minimum check that you meet the minimum requirements. Um, then that gets filtered through, you know, our actual like human recruiters who review and they have specific areas or job families or teams that they hire for. So they will kind of do another layer um, of screening to, you know, connect, um, reach out to you, get to know a little bit more about your background. So it's a little bit of um, playing around kind of with your resume to kind of get it through the system um, if you were to just directly apply. Um, other avenues are going to be through folks you know, whether that's like friends, family, but even just through a lot of different programs that we have at Google. Um, if you don't know anyone that works here, you can still connect to folks through what we call like our Googler or like our champion program. You can have coffee chats with people to tell them a little bit about yourself and your background, and then you can ask them to uh, refer you or use them as a referral. So that's another way to kind of get your resume um, to the right folks here. So again, a lot of different paths, but I would explore all of them if you can. Yeah, I'd love to chime in on this, um, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, like, so, well, first, I actually want to chime in on the last question. So the AI question, um, agree, I think there's a new landscape for it. I think it's definitely helpful. But I will caution um, that, you know, not to take everything as that, uh, in, well, that you see in AI, like as a source of truth, right? Like, I think there still needs to be your voice, your authenticity into it. Like, don't just have chat G GPT spit out a resume and then you submit that, right? Um, me and my team, you know, like we have been pretty diligent about looking at resumes, which is kind of getting into the next answer. Um, and we've been seeing a lot of, you know, resumes that look alike or seem the same or sound the same. Um, and so we're even starting to pick up on it. Like, okay, we get it. It's a tool that you can use, um, you know, to help you, but don't take it as a source of truth, copy and paste it and submit it because we are starting to see resumes that look and sound the same. Um, with that said, in our recruiting process, there are actually eyes on your resume. So, um, you know, I know there's a lot of like talk about like the bot and like, oh, it's just like this, this thing that takes your resume and it goes into a black hole. Like me and my team actually look at resumes. Like we go through our ATS. We look at every resume that comes through. Um, and, you know, we review it against the job description. We get it in front of hiring managers. Like we talk through, um, you know, what the profiles look like. And then that's how we identify like who moves forward in the process, like whose resume and whose experience like aligns best to the job that we are hiring for. The other thing is on LinkedIn, like we actually do look for people on LinkedIn as well. So there are uh, what we call sorcerers or researchers on our team that go out onto LinkedIn and look up or look for profiles that are based on that job description. So we also look for keywords and certain experiences um, on your profile. And so this is actually a, like a, um, a push to tell y'all like, make sure you're updating your LinkedIn, like actually putting information in there, not just your title and not just the, the company you work for, but like actual things that you have done, accomplished, had impact on, because that's how you come up in our searches. So like, if you want me to find you, right, like you have to like actually have a built out um, uh, LinkedIn profile. So that is that yeah that's going to be one one push i'll i'll say right now for that um but other than that yeah we we look at resumes all day long yeah no that's such a good point um gbt is only as good as your input right so if you have a very generic input like give me a resume and cover letter 
they're going to spit something out that they spit out for like everyone else in the world. And like, that's going to be very obvious. You have like an AI version of yourself online. But if you say, Hey, like, this is my experience. How many like years I've been dabbling in this. These are my projects. And you actually input a ton of information into GPT. You can actually get like a unique output that can be handy and useful for you in the process. That's not going to look like everyone else's, but obviously you have to put that initial upfront work of like building your experiences and talking about it for GPT to like give you that result. So it's kind of like, it. it's the tool. It's like an aid to get you to some like final version, but you do still have to do that like initial unique work upfront for this tool to actually be useful for you. So yeah, totally plus one to like everything you said. Um, I think that's like super important. Okay, cool. Jumping into more questions here. We can do a little uh, hot take. What is everyone's thoughts on the current job market? Like are companies hiring right now? Um, yeah, I think companies are um, definitely hiring. There are um, a lot that I've been seeing and I've seen a lot more candidates get offered. I really do think that, you know, so many people like reach out to me. They're like, what's wrong with me? Like, why can't I get an offer? Like sometimes there really isn't anything wrong with you. It really is just the market. Like your resume could be perfect. Um, you'd be doing everything right. You'd be networking, but it is like competitive right now. So I would just be gentle and have grace with yourself. Yeah, so true. Anyone else want to add something to that? Yeah, I can definitely add a little bit to that. Um, what Linda said is true. There's there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. It, it is a crazy market. Um, what I have noticed is that Google is hiring, um, but because managers are restricted and they have limited resource and, you know, before they would hire and kind of talk through, okay, this person has potential, but they are from the top down being told um, just to to be more specific, right? So what that translates to in your job search is even being more intentional about the roles that you're applying for. Um, historically at Google, you know, you go through an interview process and then you find a team to match with, and then you kind of discuss your skills specific to that team. Now it's a little bit reverse. So when you are applying, you are applying to roles on a specific team that require specific specific skill set or background or interest. Um, so a lot of you who are entry level, um, who are going through an internship and kind of getting that first job, highlight some of the projects that you've done and look for the teams that are essentially solving the problems that you're interested in and that you've got some sort of research or project or academia or even side hobbies relevant to that. Those all count. But what I'm saying is don't blanket apply. Um, you do have to be specific and try to meet as much of the criteria as possible. And those that you don't have that direct match or direct requirement, call out some of the things that you've done that's similar. Again, focus on some of the things, the problems that you've solved that that team is ultimately trying to solve for as well. So just really, really granular and specific. I'd right. Like to add yeah, as well. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'd love to add as well um, in terms of, yeah, like looking at the different industries, right? Because I think we're all from different industries, but there are pools that are hiring, right? So like, even though tech has gone through some, you know, wild layoffs, like there's still companies in tech that are hiring, like Google, for example, right? Um, you know, I... I'm really deep in the gaming industry and the gaming industry has been super impacted this year. And it's been really hard to see, like even in my 10 years time, it's like, it's probably the wildest time in the industry, but there are studios, game studios that are still hiring. Right. So like, I think it's also like taking a deep dive in those different like industries that you're interested in. Um, but then also like, you know, being open to like industries that aren't impacted, like tech might be impacted, but is healthcare impacted? Like, you know, maybe there's opportunities there, right? Um, and, you know, I think at this early stage of your career too, like right now you're also building just your, your skill set, right? And so I wouldn't get so tied to like, oh, I just want to be in tech. I just want to be in entertainment. I only want to be in X, Y, and Z. But really like, you know, I think with the times, like you also have to be flexible and kind of open to like what is going on out there. So, uh, but being careful and mindful that just because one in industry is shaky doesn't mean that everything in it or you know all the companies within it are shaky like there are just like some things that are happening but I think staying on top of trends you know uh, taking a look at um 
news in those industries and really kind of understanding the landscape of like what is shifting, I think that can really give a lot more insight than just going on LinkedIn and like, okay, everyone in the tech industry is laying off today. Like, I guess everything sucks. Like a lot of things suck, but there will be pockets that I think like, you know, again, takes a little bit of time to like research it, but, um, you know, hopefully that's something y'all will find. Totally. I feel like this is a perfect time to talk about career pivots because I feel like it is a little bit related to what you're saying, where oftentimes it's easier to make a career pivot um, when you're looking at maybe staying within an industry or hopping between industries to do that pivot. Um, are career pivots like reasonable right now in this market where things are so competitive? Is this like not the time to pivot in a career? Is this a better time to pivot in a career? Like what is everyone's thoughts specifically for people who are trying to do very different things than they currently have experience for? I'll uh I'll jump in here and just kind of just speak from my my own experience because I I career pivoted during the pandemic, right? And you know many would say that probably is not a great idea, you know, and you know things are like shut down and you know there you know there's all there was also you know an influx of people that were searching for jobs, and so there was this definitely natural discomfort with you know is this the right decision going from a place that I'm comfortable with you know, I know I can do the job, I know everybody, and I love what I do, to, you know, working in tech um, in a position I've never done before, right? I've done a lot of related things, and I know I could do that job. And I think that at the time, I was looking for a lot of different things that aligned with what I, with what I did. And I felt like University of Korea was the best match and best transition for me. Like, it was a smooth transition because I got to continue working with young adults um, at universities. Um, and I you know, touched on recruiting in the past as well. And so, <laughs> and you know what, the salary didn't hurt. <laughs> the salary was a, a nice little uh, push in, the, in that direction to kind of you know, take, that, take that jump. Um, and asking the right questions as well to just make sure that it's the right choice. You know, I, I, I asked like, hey, you know, why are you hiring for these roles? You know, like, you know, have there been any layoffs lately, you know, on the team? And when I heard like about the tenure of some of the people on the team, they're like, even during the pandemic, we didn't really, we didn't have any layoffs on the team. And so I was like, okay, that sounds, that sounds good, you know? And to this day, you know, we've made it to this point and thank God, you know, I have, I have, you know, been uh, fortunate not to be, you know, uh, laid off in this position, you know, cause I know that there are a lot of recruiters out there who are less fortunate, right? So I think that just doing your homework, asking the right questions and making sure that where you're going is the right fit for you, right? The team is the right fit for you, right? And it all just kind of feels right. right? If there's someone, if the, if the team was like, you know, they were all like assholes or something like that, then yeah, I probably wouldn't have taken the job. But that's just my experience, career pivoting in a time that was just a lot of uncertainties. Uh, and I think the same can be said today, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty when career pivoting. So it's just doing a lot of the homework and making sure that it's the best situation for you and your situation. How can we do more of that homework? Like, do you have any tips or recommendations? You could ask, you could always ask ChatGPT, right? Hey, you know, what questions should I ask? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but, um, you know, asking the right questions. When I was, you know, interviewing, you know, I did a, I did a lot of Google searching, right? I did a lot of research to see like, what are like the best questions to ask during the interview process? You know, I did my homework. I asked my friends, you know, like, hey, you know, what should I be asking at this point in the interview process? You know, how should I be following up? You know, there was a lot of that going on. And so I really kind of just kind of crowdsourced. I leaned on my community. I leaned on my friends to ask them, you know, you know, what was what I should be doing kind of in this space because they're that they were the experts and I was kind of like this newcomer coming in. Right. And so I kind of depended a little bit and, you know, um, listened to the advice from others and took that and applied it. So a combination of doing your research, you know, on something as simple as Google, you know, and doing a quick Google search to figure out what kind of questions you should be asking, doing research on career pivoting, um, finding individuals who have career pivoted, you know, during difficult times is probably one of the best resources you could probably 
you know, come in contact with is someone who's done it before, right? And oftentimes we call those people mentors. Yes, mentors are so important. Well, I would love for one of you to share a story, maybe, of the most memorable experiences you've had with an applicant, um, specifically like what made them stand out to you. I can share I a story. Um, so this is my long game story. I've shared this a couple of times, but it's it's so resonant with me because I think it just proves that networking works. <laughs> Um, but I had a candidate, uh, so it took three years for him to land a job with me, somewhere with me. Um, but so the first year he interviewed, did great, didn't get selected, was what we call like a silver medalist, right? Like he was just like second place to the candidate in the candidate pool. Um, and he stayed in touch with me. You know, he was like, this sucks. You know, I'm, it's a bummer. I'm not going to get this role, but, you know, would love to just stay in touch. Staying in touch man actually just being a friend like he you know would just check in and say hey like how are things going um by the way i'm working on a new project at you know my job and i think it really aligns with that role that i interviewed for and hopefully this makes my skill set better um happy holidays you know things like that year 2 interviewed again almost got it still didn't get the job right and so and i was already advocating for for his um for his his profile. I was, you know, I told the hiring manager, Hey, he interviewed before he did great. He just, you know, didn't make the cut, but we still kept in touch. And I think he sees awesome. He told me about all these new projects that he's worked on, etc. So he interviewed, you know, manager still liked him, but was like, ah, I found someone that was stronger, but either way, you know, the hiring manager was still impressed. And so, you know, we let him go uh, again. It was a bummer for him. Like, darn, you know, I really was hoping I was going to get that job, um, but it's all good. I'll continue to stay in touch. So he stays in touch in between. He gets a new job somewhere else. He actually, you know, gets, a, you know, up levels into another role, continues to tell me about, you know, all these different projects he's working on, how it aligns with his skills. And then year three, I actually reach out to him because, I have a role. My hiring manager was like, hey, I'm opening this role. Immediately think of him. And I'm like, I know who you should talk to. You need to talk to my friend. Um, and so I get him in front of the hiring manager. Um, you know, they have conversations. He goes through the interview process and lands the job. And that took three years. And I know a lot of y'all are probably like, I don't got time for three years. I need a job today. Um, and I totally get that. But that was the power of networking. That was the power of the long game. That was the power of, hey, this sucks that I didn't get the job twice with the same recruiter too. I thought he would have hated me by that time. But instead was like, you know what? I'm just going to keep trying. I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to up level. I got a job somewhere else. You know, I, I did extra projects at my companies and I just got better. And then that just became, you know, and that's how he advocated for himself too. Um, but it gave me a reason to stay in touch. And again, like it was just kind of magic because I was like, oh, this role had his name on it almost. Right. And like, that was something that me and him like to, um, you know, celebrate that. Wow. Like when that role came up and that hiring manager said, I'm opening X, Y, and Z, I was like, I already have a candidate for you period. And so that's my favorite story to tell. Um, again, it talks about that long game. It talks about networking. It talks about like how just keeping relationships warm and um, important, you know, like that, that stuff can actually work. So totally like when you are the one of one person that they're thinking about, like you get the job yep. and like, no one said you have to get your dream job the first time you try, right? Like you can have other jobs in the meantime, but consistently, you know, chip away at that goal of like, whatever that dream job is for you. So I think another thing I want to add is like, he was really focused on what he wanted and was clear about what he wanted. So yep. that also for sure really helps you actually the likelihood of you getting that in the end. Um, really cool story. Thank you for sharing. Does anyone else want to share a story? I just want to chime in real fast to that. Yeah. It took me, I think, five jobs before I got to my dream job. Because yeah. when I was fresh out of college, I'm like, I wanted to work. At the time, it was for Disney. And yeah. I got rejected a bunch of times. And I looked at the people who were working there. And I saw the experience that they had leading up to that. And I got those jobs. Entry level, made my way. It, and eventually, I made myself qualified. But yeah, it it takes a while. And you have to take those stepping stones to get there. and 
that does take time. Totally. I mean, I'm definitely still trying to find it. Like first, I'm still on my way. <laughs> um, no, thanks for adding that. Anyone else want to share a story? I think um, candidates that I've seen that have really like stood out, it's not so much like they send like a follow-up like email or to say like, thank you. Um, it's so much that they're just so like kind during the process. Like they follow up, like they check in, like they're not like super like aggressive or disrespectful. Like those candidates have stood out so much um, throughout the hiring process to me and especially like hiring managers that I've seen. It's just like, like how you treat your recruiting coordinators and how you treat your recruiters, it really does impact how the hiring managers like see you because hiring managers speak with the recruiters and the recruiting coordinators. We all work very close. Like I, I never forgot, like there was a situation where a candidate was so disrespectful to me and so disrespectful to the recruiting coordinator team. Like they didn't get the job because of that. Like in like one of my previous like companies, like it's like we we all work together. It's just like how you treat one person is how you're going to treat the entirety. And it's like, it speaks a lot on your character. Totally. Character is for sure 100% a part of the interview process. It's not just what's on your resume. So no, that was a great story to share. Thank you. Anyone else add in a story? I think I just want to piggyback off of what Linda said. Like the interview process is, yeah, like your time to shine. So yeah, don't be a jerk during that. But also even after you get rejected, that's still kind of part of the interview. Um, I know Linda, Manny, and Leanna probably have seen like my LinkedIn posts about like awful, awful candidates who literally like just say the most horrid things, you know, after they get rejected. And even though they think the interview is done, like my hiring manager sees those, you know, like my team sees those the other recruiters see those. And so when you decide to like, you know, react at a rejection, like real negatively, that could totally like, you know, you know, impact how you show up again, um, you know, for, you know, for the next time. And so, yes, like in your interview process, just be kind, just be nice. And even at the rejection, go to the gym and punch it out, but like, don't take it out on your recruiter or your coordinator or anyone, cause that can follow you. So I just wanted to, to say that. Yeah, just really quick. Um, I completely agree with you. Like um, I've had candidates who've been so kind to me after they get rejected and I put them like on a wait list. And then yep. when another role opens up, if they were a backfill, I literally tell the hiring manager, I'm like, this guy was so nice to me. Like he's on the wait list. Like if there's a position and I've seen candidates get like, job offers after being so kind and we remember the ones who are nice like we there's a wait list like we don't just forget about you if there's another opportunity we will reach out yep agreed oh wow no that makes so much sense and like there's a reason why people say your digital footprint is permanent like it, it can be an email but that that's still on the internet that still doesn't like that's still part of your track record so it's really important how you, you treat people and almost especially online because that is not going anywhere and it's following you. So um, yeah, such a good point that you, the whole you made. What do you feel like has been some current trends or micro trends you've seen in hiring recently? And do you see these similar trends in hiring um, happening early next year or do you see different things happening in the hiring space next year? Sorry, Omni. Um, can you repeat that one more time? <laughs> yeah. Um, what are some current trends or micro trends in hiring you've seen recently? And how do you see hiring going next year? I'll chime in first. I think what uh, Leanna said about how hiring managers are being more specific or selective. I think that's going to follow. Oh, that's the trend now. And I think that will follow. Um, you know, I think the wave of the different industries, the layoffs, you know, how the whole landscape is looking, it's still trying to course correct. And I don't, I personally don't think it's going to course correct itself and be done. I think it's going to take time. Like anything that will get better will take time. So the trend is, yeah, like hiring managers are going to be really, really specific um, they're going to be looking at, you know, things more in with a granular lens. Um, and so I think that will follow into the next year. 
Um, but I think that will just continue to follow for a while. Like, I don't think I'm not, to, that's not to say that, oh, once all of this, you know, crappiness is done, you know, managers are going to just be like gung ho and open everything. Like, I think that's going to follow. Like, I think they're always going to start to really think more specifically, um, in terms of what they're looking. And so I think that trend from a candidate perspective is also for you to get specific and, you know, really start to anchor like, yeah, what are you looking for? What do you want? How will you get those skills? Um, Because I think, yeah, like with any trend that is happening, like it's, you know, if it's going to impact how we recruit, then like how you show up as candidates, like should also, you know, be malleable and be flexible so that you can also kind of, you know, navigate through that with us. Cool. Well, let's talk about like cycles of applying. Like, is there a certain time of the year that it's better to apply to? Or are we, are companies hiring like year round? I can um, answer that. So within like one year, I filled like 300 like positions or sent out 300 offers. And honestly, like there's always these trends where it's just like, this, this, and that, like, I got, like, almost, like, dozen, like, multiple interviews, like, last, like, during the peak of layoffs, and it was because, like, like, networking, curating your resume, tailoring your job description, and there was one thing that I did that, like, when I reached out to hiring managers, like, no one else did, that's how I got, like, my foot in the door, was I searched for director of talent acquisition and recruiting manager, so many people think, like, oh, you should reach out to recruiters, but to be really honest with you, like, unless you're an internal recruiter, like no one's going to be able to help you. So director of talent acquisition handles the entire team. So if you get into like good graces with them, they're going to reach out to their hiring team to see where they can help place you. So like why start at the bottom and then have to work your way up, just start at the top and they're going to help you work your way down. Yep. No, but that's great advice. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about personal branding. Do you guys, like, what are your thoughts on personal branding? How does that help you stand out as an applicant? And do you guys actually go through your LinkedIn feeds and notice people and reach out um, to candidates that are posting online? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I'll just speak specifically for me. So I, my feed is very much curated to the games industry. So I actually um, follow a lot of people that just make games but I hire people who make games. And so if there's a d game designer or a producer or um, an artist, you know, that's like, you know, just talking on my feed, like, uh, you know, sharing games that they're playing, games that they've made, something that they're working on, you know, um, you know, projects that they're side projects or side gigs that they're working on. Um, if I see their portfolio or their, you know, their profile and it's like, oh, wow, this producer like works on something that we're going to be making or doing here, you know, in our studio, I'll reach out and connect. Like, I'll just, you know, like, hey, I saw your post. Like, you know, I, I just looked at your profile. Like, you look cool. Like, you know, there's some stuff in your profile that I'd be interested in, um, you know, would love to to stay in touch about that. And so, I am constantly like just using my LinkedIn feed. Like I'm already there because my own brand, um, I'm already there because I just, again, love talking about video games. Um, but I have seen like an uptick in people that I do connect with for like future opportunities um, just because they're just there. Like they're just making content or just talking about games. And so, yes. Yeah, yeah that makes so much sense. Yeah, just to chime in too, plus one to that, I definitely notice when people are making content um, or even if just the level of engagement um, with posts that are you know relevant to, to certain industries. Relevance, I think, is key because I've also had folks who may share content with me, share something that they've created that is not relevant to what they're asking for in terms of like a job search. And so in those situations, um, it just doesn't really match. And therefore there's really no benefit in doing that. But if you're not a content creator, engaging with other people's content, showing interest, whether it's in blogs or things, right, that are kind of aligned in that industry or the field or the product or the technology that you're interested in can also go a long way. I was um, just to, piggyback on 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 this um on that note 
I was actually having a conversation with uh, some of the panelists um, last night about, you know, just standing out in the job market right now. And um, since I kind of, I specialize with especially software engineering and hiring uh, interns in that area, um, what I've noticed is that many are kind of more shy to kind of start creating content and posting about their personal journeys or, you know, just anything, you know? Um, and I think because of kind of seeing that, I feel like those who do are going to stand out, right? Because there are so many who are not willing to do something like that and to kind of, you know, step out of their comfort zone or break out of a shell and, you know, share their knowledge, share their experiences with, let's be honest, complete strangers, right? Um, on LinkedIn, you know, when we're posting and, you know, we're talking, we don't really know who that's going to reach. And that can be a little uncomfortable. Um, but one thing that I've learned is that when you are creating, you know, you're not going to be able to please everybody with whatever you're saying, right? It's, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, our feeds, yeah, our feeds can be tailored or like, you know, specific to, you know, the area that we're in. So like 90% 90, 90 of the time, you know, we may be pleasing people, but the other 10%, maybe people disagree with us. Um, and so I think that stepping out of your comfort zone and, you know, being able to share is, is a good thing. And cause I, 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 def, I believe in lifting as we climb, right. Sharing our knowledge and sharing with each other to uplift those around us. They say, uh, what is it? What's that phrase? When the, uh, tide rises, all boats rise together, something along the lines of that. So I just wanted to just put that out there and kind of nudge any people in tech, software engineers who may be reluctant to do something like that and do it. That is all. Yes, exactly. That's please empower everyone. And like more things will come back to you, like for sure. That is a real thing. Um, how about when it comes to candidates asking for feedback when they do get reject rejected from the position? How do you guys feel about that? And do you guys respond to it? Absolutely respond to it. Um, it's okay. It's absolutely great. And to, to ask that, right? Because we understand as recruiters, we understand how much time you have spent as candidates preparing for these interviews, um, studying for these interviews and, you know, feedback, whether positive or, or negative can only help you. Um, keep in mind that organizations sometimes have kind of rules on how the specific feedback we're able to give. Um, and it will, will vary person to person, right? Um, Google has a general rule, like we can't tell you like, this is where you did well, this is where you did not. But as a recruiter, I also empathize. And so I try to give that person um, at least like a theme or a trend that I've seen to help them when they do decide to come back and try again. Um, but absolutely ask for feedback with the, the understanding that, you know, the recruiters will give you what they can. Yeah, I'll chime into that. Yeah. So um, I've only worked at companies where we're not allowed to share um, specific feedback. But as Leanna said, like, as a recruiter, I know how important that is. And so I will also do something similar where I'll really pick out themes or really like anchor to um, the job description, right? So like most recently, like I had to reject someone um, who didn't have mobile games experience. Like they've never made a mobile game before, but that's super important for this role. Um, but you know, that was one of the cases on like why we weren't able, we weren't able to move on because they missed or didn't have deeper experience with that. Right. Um, so, so yeah, so that's as much as I will try to say, um, you know, of course, like we want to say more, like, I think a lot of us are in it, um, you know, and have our hearts in it with you that we want to share, um, you know, more specifics to help you out, but there are limitations, but I will say if a recruiter does give you any type of feedback, when you ask, my advice also is to be ready for that. I think another piece is some people do ask for feedback and when I've given it to them, they've just like, cussed me out and I'm like wait 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 hold on you asked for this <laughs> you know oh, so I think like also being okay with receiving feedback even if it sucks and you don't like it like be ready to hear it if that's what you truly want so yeah yeah I love that Marie I where where I was previously previously at 
you know, it was, we would always say that feedback is a gift. Um, and there's definitely a skill on receiving it as well as giving it. Um, because, you know, especially when you have to give like feedback upwards, you know, actually I, I wanted to do that today to a, a like a manager. Um, but I haven't because it's, you know, a manager and that's above my pay grade. I don't need to do that. No, I'm just kidding. But feedback is a gift and receiving it is definitely, it's, it's harder to receive something like that, especially if it's a growth area of yours. Um, and so oftentimes when providing feedback or receiving it, you know, we would encourage people to point out a strength, something that that person's doing well, but also, you know, um, adding in like a growth area and trying your best not to sandwich it, right? Like, Hey, you're, you're doing great at this, but you know, here's an area that you can grow with, but you're doing great, you know, and don't sandwich things to kind of sugarcoat it, you know, just give them the feedback. And so when you re receive that, you know, and maybe just we're not used to receiving feedback, um, but there's definitely, you know, a right and wrong way to receive it for sure. But I just wanted to point that out that, you know, it's a gift. It helps us grow. One framework I really like doing is the start, stop, continue method for feedback. And so it it gives an easy way for you to give them the hard thing because you're also giving them like a feedback for something they should continue doing. And it's it's kind of like the right way to sandwich feedback um, that's still constructive. So maybe if anyone wants to use that as a, as a method, but cool. Well, let's talk about citizenship because that is something on everyone's mind. Is there an advantage to getting a job if you have a US citizenship? Um, I don't think it's US citizenship. I think as long as you're eligible to work in the US. Yeah, okay, that's a good clarification. Mm -hmm. So if you're eligible, eligible to work in the US, do you think there's an advantage to getting the job versus someone who requires a work visa? Right. Um, I not really. So if you are eligible to work in the US, that's great. I mean, you also have to look at like the the uh, requirements of the job, like most of the jobs that I hire for are, are going to going to be in the US and Canada. Mm -hmm. Like that's just how my studio is set up right now. Right. So like we're not hiring outside anywhere else. Um, but I think there is, you can still apply, like if you do need like visa requirements, because I've also worked in places where like some hiring managers and some teams are okay with that. Like the company will sponsor it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say like there is an advantage or a disadvantage. I think like, yeah, as long as you are eligible, um, you know, but like, you know, you feel like you are, you know, eligible for that job too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, it's hard to tell, but there are companies that are okay to sponsor. So, yeah, I've noticed that the roles in the companies that are open to it will explicitly state that up front versus mm -hmm. the ones that are not will also explicitly state that up front. And so making, right. make sure you like read that and also are applying to those roles according to, but mm -hmm. it is, yeah, that makes sense. Um, moving into certificates, like AWS certificates, do these help as skills on your resume? And does this actually help you stand out an application process? And what kind of roles does this matter for versus they don't? So think like online certifications you get versus um, kind of like on the side. Mm -hmm. There's Azure certificates, things like that. I would probably say, I think they're great. Like, I think, yeah, if you put in the time and the effort to get those certifications, um, that's a good thing. But I think the next level is how have you put that in practice, mm -hmm. right? So like, I can get all the, all the certifications that I want to, but like, if I don't do anything with it, like, is that really putting it at an advantage for me, right? So like, if you get the AWS certification, my hiring manager might be like, that's great. So what did they use? What did they do with that? Right. And like, I need to be able to look at a profile at a LinkedIn page at a resume that says, oh, okay, well, this is where they applied it. Right. But if you, it wasn't applied anywhere, 
um, I think that's going to be a harder sell. So I would say like, get the certification if you want it, like absolutely. Uh, but be ready to also like put that in practice and like put that somewhere or towards something um, so that it, you know, it connects for like the, the recruiter, but also connects for like the hiring manager, like, you know, who's looking at your profile. Right. That makes sense. And building your portfolio with those certificates and those skills that you're acquiring. Totally. Mm -hmm. Cool. Are there any biases against early career professionals who got laid off? Since the market is saturated with all levels of job applicants, is there more of an emphasis choosing a candidate that is currently employed rather than a candidate that got laid off and has been still freelancing or gaining hard skills aside to stay afloat? Can you repeat the first part of that question? Yes. Are there biases against early career professionals who got laid off versus uh, I want someone who's currently in a job? I can take a stab at this. Um, and, and, you know, I think oftentimes, I mean, at least when I'm speaking, it's just my personal opinion. So I don't, I don't speak for the rest of the panel at all. But um, what I will say is no, I do not think so. I think that there's definitely... Um, for people who, I don't think that there is a bias between the two, but I do think that there is advantages of being employed and job searching while being employed. Um, and I think I was listening or reading something about this the other day. And what happens is when you are employed, right, you don't have that pressure, right? You know, like you get a, you have like multiple job offers potentially, or you don't have like this pressure to rush and find a job ASAP versus someone who may be unemployed and, you know, kind of freelancing on the side um, and needing a job, you know, um, a lot more urgently, you know, may need to choose, you know, like the first thing they maybe get and, you know, not be able to wait for options. So I definitely think that there's an advantage to, you know, searching when you are employed. And I think that kind of goes into this like theme of like, you know, when you are in a place of comfort, you know, making sure that you're, you know, always networking, keeping your eyes open, you know, making friends. Um, so that, so that way, you know, if, if, and when you decide to start applying, you know, you, you can come from a place where you're not rushed and you can give yourself those options. So don't think that there's necessarily a bias here between, you know, when we're recruiting and someone who, you know, was laid off um, versus, you know, if they're currently employed. And I don't, I don't think that's something I, I ask in the interview process, but I mean, I'll, I'll pass this on to the rest of the recruiters because they're more like on the more, more mid to senior level side of recruiting. I'm more like on the like intern and like, you know, uh, entry level. So I'm not like dealing with interns who are getting laid off, you know? So yeah, I can, here. I can add to this. Yeah. So at least for, from my perspective and my experience, like, yeah, like obviously like, because I'm so targeted with the games industry and like seeing that there have been a lot of um, layoffs in the games industry, like me and my team actually go out and try and seek those people who've been laid off. Um, you know, like we are like, you know, it's, that's the kind of like the candidate pool. And, you know, I think Manny is right. Like I deal with a lot more like senior um, and, you know, senior level hiring. And so, you know, when, when those companies or when those studios start to lay off, like me and my team were like, well, you know, like those, obviously like we have community, like the game industry is very small. And so we also like extend to them like, wow, like this, this sucks. We're so sorry that you're going through this, but we also are like, yeah, but you're also kind of the talent and the candidate pool that we would be looking at anyways. Um, so, you know, like, I think that is where like, we also extend like, Hey, there's job opportunities here at our studio. Like feel free to reach out to us if you're interested, et cetera. Um, but I do like what Manny said about like, you know, still being employed and still looking for a job. Like, I don't think there is any um, biases towards anyone. I think there is advantages to both, right? Like, again, like being employed and looking for a job, like, you know, you're in, you're kind of in a better space, um, you know, whether that be mentally or whatever. Um, but then like, as someone who has been laid off, like there's actually people who are like, oh my God, I want to help you. Like, I want to help and like, make sure that you can find something some somewhere, um, similar to like what I do when like, you know, game studios, um, get laid off. Like, I'm just like, oh my God, how can I help you? Like my, my whole network is also all people in game. So like, 
even if I don't get you a job here at Netflix, like I know people at PlayStation and EA and Xbox and et cetera, like, let me go put your name over there so that like, it can help you out. Um, so I think it's just, yeah, like it, it's more of like just an advantage, um, you know, either way. Totally. I mean, I think like there's this also this aura and level of confidence you bring in an interview when you already have a job that naturally makes it easier for you to seem desirable um, to the hiring manager and to the interview as well. So yeah, plus one to both things that you guys said. I think it's it, it's not necessarily that there is a preference, but you are in a better mental space because of like, you don't have that scarcity mindset. And that like probably puts you in front of other applicants to make it seem like there is this preference or something like that. So that that actually makes a ton of sense. Moving on to other questions. Um, let's talk about when it comes to here. so many questions and there's two more minutes. I want to pick a good one. I guess, why don't we just go around the room once and what's your best piece of advice you have for job seekers right now? I can go first. Um, just remember, you know, at the end of the day, like it's a job, you know, it doesn't define you. Your resume is a piece of paper. It doesn't define you. The only person who needs to see your worth at the end of the day is you. Like you come first, like a job comes second. And I cannot like reiterate that enough. Like I know, like I put like I felt worthless when I was unemployed for six months and like I would have to I took a job at like Whole Foods while I had to like look to pay my bills and there is absolutely no shame in having to do something like that and then along the way the right job came along and it took months and hours and rejections and having hiring managers say that I was incompetent and all of these things but like having like support and community and just resilience to know that it's not you, it's them. If you don't get this job, you get the next one. Uh, I'll, I'll go, because I, I, I gotta jump to a, a, a meeting in a minute here. Um, so someone once said uh, in my previous job, nonprofit, that um, being in a place of comfort is a beautiful, it's a beautiful place, but nothing grows there. Okay, so that always stuck with me. And, you know, I I like to kind of, you know, remember this when I'm feeling like, hey, you know, you know, feeling pretty comfy where I'm at, you know, and like, you know, maybe it's time to like, you know, switch things up. But that that applies to all walks of life, right? You know, when you're comfortable doing something, you know, we're not really growing when we're in, when we're in that space necessarily. So I just want to put that out there, you know, and do something that maybe, you know, is outside of your comfort zone, you know, do something that you normally wouldn't do um, and apply it maybe to even your job search, you know, apply it to that and see what happens, test, iterate, and see what works best for you and your situation. So that's all for me. I got to run. Thank you, Avni. Thank you, everybody. Hit me up on LinkedIn. If uh, y'all have other questions or want to connect, got to go. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye, Manny. Bye, Manny. Leanna, did you want to go next or you want me to go? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, my advice for everyone um, is similar to Manny's. I agree. Like, I think it's an uncomfortable time right now, um, but go do some uncomfortable things, you know, because that is how you will show up, how you'll be found, how you will stand out. Like, I've seen in the chat a couple of times, how do I stand out? How do I stand out? You have to do stand out things. <laughs> like you can't get comfortable and then expect the world to find you, right? Like I think it is, you know, being loud, you know, getting your voice out there and it is uncomfortable, but that is how you stand out. When you go against what a lot of people probably will do is like, I'm not going to listen to this advice that Marie is giving me right now. I think it's trash and I'm just going to sit here and be quiet. Like, okay. And like, how will that work for you? Right? Like, I think there are um, advantages to like stepping out of that comfort zone and doing something out of your comfort zone. Um, if you truly do want to stand out. Um, and I think doing that again, you don't have to 
go and do something totally uncomfortable in terms of like, this doesn't make me feel good. Like do something uncomfortable that still makes you feel good. I think a lot of the questions too are about branding and like, how do I get out there and build my brand? Build it. People aren't going to like it, but guess what? You will build a village and a support network of people who will like it. Right. Um, but that's because you put yourself out there. You did something to stand out. People saw it and now they're going to collect around you. Right. And I think opportunities are the same way. Like when you build opportunities for yourself, other opportunities will find itself to you. So I just wish everybody luck, um, you know, on the journey ahead. I know it's stressful. I know it sucks out there. Uh, be in your feels, you know, that's totally OK. Uh, but be kind at the end of it. Yeah, I think just plus one to, to what Linda, Manny, and Marie said, it's, it's definitely tough out there and it's very easy to feel discouraged. Um, somewhere in the chat, further above, someone talked about imposter syndrome and know that, you know, whenever you are reaching out to someone for assistance, when you're asking them for help, or if you have that hesitation, um, you know, know that that person has been in your shoes at one point in time in their career. Um, I've been, I was recruiting. I've been recruiting for probably 15 some odd years. I just transitioned to a new role. I have imposter syndrome every day. It doesn't matter what level or experience you have, you're going to have that. And so I think, you know, just thinking that like the person you're reaching out to, whether it's for feedback or for um, a favor or for a referral or for guidance, again, at one point they've been in your shoes and most people, if you're asking in the right way, are, are happy to help. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. Use and leverage every resource you have, whether conventional or not. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Leanna. And thank you, Manny, who just left. Like, you don't understand that your time is very valuable. And I know everyone in the chat is super grateful. And we all learned so much. So thank you again. And take care, everyone. Hope that was helpful. Thank Bye. you. Bye.